I spent a week in a camper van travelling along the Scotland-England border. Today, I want to see if I can walk the very last piece of that border that was ever created. It's a thickly wooded demarcation line that makes it pretty clear that Scotland is on one side and England on the other. They call it the Scots Dyke. Now this is a bit different from my normal videos because you're going to have to bear with me as I show you the footage of me clambering my way along the last piece of the Scotland-England border. But if you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then click the subscribe button at the bottom right of the screen. In the meantime, let me tell you a story. There's a strip of land approximately 12 miles by 4 along the River Esk that was famed for lawlessness, reaving and independence. The Grahams on one side of the river and the Armstrongs in their Gurnocky Tower to the north. Add to them the Nixons, the Elliots and more. Nobody in Edinburgh or London was quite sure who belonged to what and what belonged to whom and what cattle belonged to anyone that could get their hands on them in the dead of night. For the most part, the border between Scotland and England had been agreed in 1237 between Alexander II of Scotland and Henry III. But 300 years later, there remained the debatable lands. So a line was drawn between the River Sark in the west and the House of Fergus Graham in the east. The one straight line across which self-respect and haggis would no longer cross. Now, I don't know how big Fergus's house was. I don't know how much land it covered. But when I came down to make a video about Kinmount Willie and his Armstrong Reavers, I stayed in the Marchbank Hotel. It's right slap bang on the border, right next to the Scotch Dyke. This wasn't the house of Fergus. This was built in 1850 as a hunting lodge for the Grahams, but it must be as close as you'll get. When I came to make the Reavers video, I treated Mrs Columbo to a couple of nights here as a reward for holding the camera and it immediately became our favourite of all the hotels we've stayed in in our trips to tell you the story of Scotland. And it's in England! <laughs> Just let me know in the comment section if you've got any hotel recommendations that we can use when we're out and about in our travels. Richard who runs this hotel, used to have a bistro in Manchester and his food is oh, even better than his chat and charm. There's genuinely no other hotel that I'd feel as comfortable recommending as this one. But don't bother trying to book online. There's no internet. These are the debatable lands. I'll leave his details in the description. You can get to the border marker on the Scots Dyke from the main A7 just after you've passed the border crossing sign. That's how we got there on our first ever visit here. It's proper overgrown and we were stung by nettles, pricked by thistles and chased by coos to make the short walk up the hill. This time, Richard pointed us to a path through the gardens of this hotel and across the field to reach the Scots Dyke marker that way. But he reckoned that walking the dyke might be tougher than we thought. As an incentive, he promised if we were up to walking the length of the dyke, he'd give us a slap-up meal and a bed for the night in our return. Now, there's a motivation to face an overgrown border defences. So, through his secret garden, they'll take us up to the field separating the hotel from the Scots Dyke. I think if I go over here, I may never be in a secret garden again. Let's have a go. Ooh. Ooh. Onward to the Scots Dyke. A lot of folks who come to the Marchbank Hotel are fishermen who while away the hours in that river esque below. More interesting to me are the fields beyond Longtown and James V's fateful Battle of Solway Moss. If you were in this field in 1542, you would have overlooked that battle that saw the Armstrongs change side and back the English part way through. 
the rest of the 1540s saw a series of battles as Henry VIII and his son Edward VI regent Somerset invaded Scotland to try to force a marriage with the child Mary Queen of Scots. It was only with Mary in France and the wars of the 1540s behind us that serious attempts could be made to negotiate a settlement on what would become the final peace in the Scotland-England border jigsaw. OK, and I've got my GoPro on my head to find out what happens. I've got my leggings to protect myself. For Once before we tried, to, we came to this point where there's a marker and I've got my legs torn to shreds by thistles. I can't imagine, if you look along here, right, this is not going to be any better, right? So, I've, however ridiculous you might think it looks, I'm wearing the leggings, right? <clears throat> and we're going to go across... Oh, this, ladies and gentlemen, is the Scots Dyke. Now, you might be asking the reasonable question, why not the English Dyke? And that's a very good point. Actually, at first, it was called the March Dyke along the border marches. But by the time that we get to General Roy's military survey in the 1700s, 200 years later, it's called the Scots Dyke. On that map, it showed parallel lines of ditches running between these two rivers. You see, what they did was to dig two parallel ditches, one on the Scottish side and one on the English side. And they threw the earth dug into the middle, leaving a wide demarcation in between. They tell me that the distance between the two ditches is supposed to be 12 feet, but it feels to me like there's been a lack of consistency. I believe the engineering term is higgledy piggledy. I've read that when they built the Scots Dyke, what happened was a bunch of Scots started digging at one end and a bunch of English started digging at the other end. And at one point they realised that they weren't going to meet. And I think this is maybe why you can see this ditch comes down here. And I think they've been digging this way. These guys have been digging that way. And it turns out <laughs> they, they weren't pointing at the same spot. And this is why this comes along here. I believe that to be the case. I can't be 100% certain. At either ends of the Scots Dyke, or the March Dyke as it was called back in the day, they erected stones with the Royal Arms of Scotland and the other mob. There's no sign of these days. You just know that there's a farmhouse somewhere with a door lintel that's a rose on the outside and a thistle on the inside. This is clearly a weight marker. Can't see. There's. You can't see anymore anything that's etched on it, okay? But at one point, this must have been a marker to indicate uh, the boundary lines. Um, I'm not sure. Ah, I wish I knew. <laughs> uh, but trust me, that's what this, I've read about these things, okay, and um, uh, there should be several of them as we go up and down the, the dike here, but this is, I'm, I'm delighted to have found uh, one of them, okay, uh, I, I'm not sure when these were put in, but I wonder when this guy put this in, what he thought this would look like in 2021. It's hard to put it to it too, but you know. They tell me it's 2022. If you're wondering why this has been largely me narrating over pictures, it's because, to be honest, sometimes doing pieces of the camera didn't go smoothly. Sometimes just crossing the ditch didn't go smoothly. Personally, I think that negotiating the boundary in the first place would have been much easier than me trying to negotiate that same boundary today. It wasn't entirely smooth, and the Reavers continued their activities. 
The difference was that Edinburgh and London had finally decided that they were going to attempt to impose law and order. As you pass, oh, you see so many, see these trees, one, two, there's one over there, uh, another one, another one, and further across there, another one, another one, another one, another one, and the Storm Arwen, I believe it was. What a, what a mess it's created, because obviously before the Storm Arwen, this was pristine uh, garden uh, that had been created. Although there's the contrast of the pristine garden with the shell case that we found here, clearly from somebody trying to escape to get over the wall from the, that's right, here's the, uh, this is obviously somebody's tried to escape to get from the English side to the freedom in Scotland. And they'll t people take all sorts of chances in order to try and survive it. Now, I don't know if the man or woman or child that this was fired at managed to survive the journey and live a life of freedom in Scotland. We can only hope that they made it. In truth, it took heavy-handed actions and it wasn't really till James VI united the crowns and the same guy was in charge on both sides of the border that order was established. And that took a lot of hangings and a lot of shipping folk across the Irish Sea. The point is that the story of the debatable lands has never been a smooth one. The Union of Crowns saw a decline in some folk's fortunes. On the other hand, it saw others gain in their moves down to London. But it did bring peace to the borders, if under a powerful monarch's hand. But this was still a border between two nation states. Different governance applied either side of it. It was particularly painful on this side of the border when English Continental Wars imposed navigation acts that blocked Scotland's trade leading to a desperate and disastrous attempt to extricate ourselves with our own colonial trade endeavour. The solution offered was a union. There's a bridge! There's a bridge! The English have got a bridge! It's just the kind of thing that they would do. That meant that this was no longer a border at all. In fact, the Scots dyke, the March dyke, was for practical purposes redundant. Of course, sometimes bridges aren't as secure as they promise to be. The very bridge that's supposed to offer safety is frightening in itself. Sometimes you'd rather go back to a safer shore where you had a bit more control. You're looking for something a bit more secure to hold on to. Sometimes, when you think you've reached the other side safely with a bit of allegorical narration that fits nicely into the footage that you filmed, some numpty for either side reads too much into it and you're having to face another obstacle. That's even worse. That is not a bridge. The bridge, and then this. I'm going to take a run at it. <laughs> so, is it possible for a fat 57 year old Afro Celt to make his way through the debatable lands along the last section of the Scottish border? It seems that it is. But the next time I do it, I think I'll wear more appropriate clothing. But to finish, like all good social media, let me show you my dinner. Mm, that <laughs> looks nice. Mm. Now, if you'd like another video about the Scotland-England border, then there's one coming up on screen now. In the meantime, I mean, dog is going to be lamb alive. Cheery and drasta. Mm.